Uh, Gunjan, you say some interesting things that, that, about sentiment, and that is that uh, just the notion of a recession, you hear that from everyone. And, and it, it almost as if it's a foregone conclusion. And I'm just wondering, is that, could that be a positive because it's priced into uh, to expectations, or do people act on their pessimistic viewpoint, and is it self-fulfilling and, and we head lower? It seems to me that whenever everyone expects something, if it's in the market, that maybe we've seen the worst. That's right. Recession, recession, recession. It seems to be, you know, what everyone can't stop talking about. And it's interesting because I do think for many investors, it's kind of become their base case at this point. You know, one investor told me this week, I think it's priced in. I am expecting a recession. It's a matter of how soon and how bad it's going to be. And the fascinating thing is that it's actually triggered kind of a reversal in the market. In July, what you've seen is these tech stocks, these growth stocks outperform because people are saying, hey, I think there's going to be a recession. That could mean more accommodative Fed policy. And, you know, we're seeing that in the yield curve. We're seeing that in interest rate expectations where people are expecting the Fed to decrease rates next year after, you know, peak pricing this year. Definitely seeing it uh, in the yield curve. We're going to talk to Mike about that. Uh, in a second. But Gunjan, one other thing that, that were, you know, I noticed that, that your point was that after this 75 basis points, there's a notion that maybe the Fed doesn't stop, but that maybe the heavy lifting is, is done at that point. And it, I guess that's because maybe the, the demand has already been, the demand slowdown they're looking for is already going to happen. That's right. People are pricing this incredibly sharp U-turn in, in interest rates. And there's a lot that can go wrong, right, with that thesis. Um, inflation may not come down as quickly as people still seem to think it will come down. And that means that the Fed can't lower interest rates, right? Mm. So there's it's, it's based on a lot of ifs right now, and it's pretty remarkable uh, yeah. how people are pricing in 75 basis points now and lower interest rates next year. Yeah, that's a problem. With, with the Fed's tool, right? They, they, all right, we did it. We, we, we caused a recession. And unfortunately, inflation is right where it was. I mean, that, that's like, think about that. that. That's why it's so difficult. And, and that would be the worst outcome. Mike, you point out uh, that previous inversions of the yield curve maybe did, were, were false flags, uh, false signals. But this one you need to pay attention to uh, in terms of, of forecasting a recession. Yeah, that's right. I mean, when you look back to late March, early April, when the yield curve inverted last, it was a completely different environment. You know, yields across the curve were going up. It wasn't just the front end that was going up. And, and typically, when, when yields are going up across the curve, meaning longer dated yields are going up too, that's not a sign of expectations for low growth. That's very different from today. Today, longer term yields are going down, while front end yields are, you know, holding steady, if not going up a little bit. And those long end yields declining is an expression of expectations for lower growth. And that makes a ton of sense. I mean, look at ISM new orders. They're in uh, contractionary territory. They're sub 50. Look at leading economic indicators on a month over month basis. They're negative. On a year over year basis, you've slipped from you know 7% uh, growth in leading economic indicators in March to only 1% today. And so, uh, you know, it's a totally different environment than just a few years ago. And the inversion of the curve is a signal that shouldn't be ignored when you have these falling long end yields. And it's going to be, not be great for banks and NIMS are going to contract and lending is going to contract. And listen, that's the whole point of what the Fed's doing to rein in demand and rein in consumption. So, you know, I don't think this is actually all that atypical. Uh, you know, this is a, a very traditional cycle in the grand scheme of things. And we would expect it to play out similar to the past. So you, after, I don't know if you've been excited about fixed income, I don't know when the last time you were, Mike, but you're excited now about opportunities in the next couple of years in fixed income. I am. I am. I actually think you can get real total return in fixed income for the first time in, you know, over a year. Um, longer dated treasuries can, can certainly offer a really good return. Um, you know, listen, the 20-year treasury currently trades at three and a quarter percent. If you just go back to where you were on December 31st of 2021, that's a 15 to 20 percent return. You know, I, I'd be hard pressed to find where, with slowing earnings growth and tightening liquidity, where you're going to get a 15 to 20 percent return in a, in a low beta safe asset. And so, you know, not saying that that will happen, but that's just the math if you go back to where you were on December 31st. And so, treasuries, I think, present a tremendous opportunity. And although corporate credit is likely to widen further over the last six months of this year, 
you're going to have another great opportunity for total return in corporate credit once that widening happens to be able to shift from interest rate risk today to credit risk in 2023. And so I think the next 12 to 18 months are going to be really, really good months for, for total return potential and fixed income. Well, now you've got me excited.